we intend to speak a little bit about, um, I would call it in short words, the changing Middle East. And I give you some perspective of my own experience and I try to integrate it into the new reality that have been built right now <clears throat> and we are still in the process and that is going on. So please, when you're asking me about the future, don't forget that I'm not a prophet. I'll try to do my best, but uh, only I can give you some kind of a new tendencies or uh, some di new directions, but not really, uh, I cannot tell you for sure that tomorrow there will be peace in Syria or something like that. Great. I uh, uh, happened to have my PhD on Sudanese studies, and it was clear that in Israel we have three experts on Sudan, and one of them sitting in the foreign ministry. It was clear that when South Sudan, uh, it was going to get its independence, it, it was clear that we will recognize the newly born country, the, the newest in, in the world, and it was clear that I'm going to go there. So uh, we start to prepare it among, uh, around a year before and uh, to see how we're going to recognize it, in what circumstances, when I'm going to go, get there and so on. Now, we're speaking about the tribal society, the jumping from the 17th century to build a nation state. It's not extremely easy to do that kind of a thing uh, under uh, circumstances of violent neighborhood, Sudan and Somalia and the Red Sea, not far away from Yemen and so on. And, um, it's a challenge to build relationship with any new country, specifically with that kind of society. And uh, <clears throat> it turned to be that they are extremely nice people. I have somebody who, who happened to be with me in South Sudan, sitting in here, and he shared some of the experiences uh, with me there. And uh, to build relationship and to see how... Uh, how is it to experience uh, developing a new country in this interesting world and how you try to maneuver, to be creative, because if you are working according to the rules, you never go anywhere, because everything is going on its own patterns and you cannot contribute the way you can do. For example, if you like to be to build and hospital or field hospital in that place. It, I don't want to go into logistics to describe to you how complicated it is, not to talk about the financing, and we did it. Or you helping with uh, agriculture or bringing uh, people to train in Israel and so on. So that was a great challenge in the time that you probably know that uh, South Sudan was separated after many years from Sudan, it was a process called the CPA. That was a six years period of agreement that South Sudan should share the leadership with Sudan from Khartoum, and then there will be a election process 2010, and then they have to decide to vote whether they want independence or autonomy, whatever. Uh, sure enough, 98.6 Percents voted for independent Sudan got independent. That happened in July the 9th, 2011. I remind you humbly that the, what called the Arab Spring started in the same year. And everybody spoke about Bouazizi, the Tunisian guy who burned himself to death, as a trigger for the Arab Spring. But in fact, if you think for a moment about division of an Arab country for the first time ever since the colonialism, Western colonialism, were in the Middle East and Africa, you actually witness a, a situation that for the first time uh, an Arab country was divided by intervention of others, for example, headed by the USA, and actually created a new situation in the Middle East. That means that Bouazizi maybe was a trigger in Tunisia, uh, but not necessarily was the only reason for that. And later on, Egypt and Libya and Syria and so on. So uh, 
And also, to portray it as an Arab Spring is a little bit mistaken. We might call it Arab shaking. Spring derived from Springs of the People, 1848 in Europe. That's a European term, not an Arab or Middle Eastern term. By the way, part of our problem is defining situation or our terminology. It depends in the eye of the beholder. If we think that in a certain situation in the Middle East, we can call some phenomenon in a name, for example, that the modern brotherhood, according to the Egyptian president Sisi, is a terrorist, is a terrorist organization. I remind you that the modern brotherhood were founded in Egypt 1928 as part of, part of the Egyptian group that had ideology. And he now uh, defines them terrorist group. Uh, others, for example, in Western Europe or in America, think that they are not terrorist uh, a group. Now, when you're coming to talk with Egyptian president about his own people, and you try to dictate him what kind of a definition he should give to its own people, that I would say a new kind of Orientalism, if you like. You cannot reinforce your attitude and your terminology on somebody else. Or you're portraying a reality in your terminology, and that becomes imagined reality. That's not the truth. I know the PC where the rep representations of reality and all of that. That's not the case. There's a, I know also that is, we're talking about <clears throat> era of post-truth as well. But somehow, somewhere, the truth is lying there. And we need, as scholars at least, or diplomats, to try to look for the truth. That is our, I think, that is our goal to, I uh, mean, what, what I'm trying to say when we are not interpret correctly realities and we're trying to use our point of view and think that the others share the same idea, that's a mistake. That a wrong reading of the reality, and that happens a lot in the Middle East, and because of globalization, it became very common to deal with it almost like part of the real problem itself. So the challenge in South, in South Sudan was not probably huge enough. So they decide when we decided in the ministry that I will move from South Sudan to Egypt. And that happened just after Morsi, the president that have been elected by the Modern Brotherhood, uh, left office or forced to leave office. And I came, um, arrived to Egypt just before Al Abdel Fattah Sisi thought or uh, planned to run for presidency. And uh, I accompanied him, uh, and then he was elected. And uh, actually, the whole situation in Egypt and beyond have changed dramatically because. Uh, if we used to have a situation, we, I mean in Israel, that we have a situation that where we were recognized as a sovereign state in 48 by the UN, in the very night that we were recognized as a sovereign state, we were, we were attacked simultaneously by five Arab countries, right? Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Jordan, and Egypt. And unfortunately, from their point of view, they didn't, didn't succeed to destroy us. In the Six-Day War, we were attacked only by three Arab countries simultaneously, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Again, it happened that they didn't succeed. In the 73 war that I happened to take care of, not far away from you, I was uh, in the Golan Heights, uh, we were attacked only by two Arab countries, Syria and Egypt. And ever since, in fact, we don't have Arab-Israeli war as such, because in 77, Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, came to Jerusalem, stood up on the Knesset together with Menachem Begin, and declared no more war, no more war, no more bloodshed, right? So the biggest Arab country, the leading of the Arab world, the symbol of pan-Arabism, made a full peace treaty with Israel. Think about it for a moment. That one, 77, 78, Camp David, of course, headed by the U.S. with a great umbrella that they gave to the part to go on and fulfill this agreement. 
79, Iranian Revolution, Islamic Revolution of Iran, very, very, very significant, that actually changed the whole situation in the Middle East from late 70s, beginning of the 80s. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, at that time, we moved from Arab-Israeli conflict to Islamic-Jewish conflict, if you like, or Islamic-Israeli conflict, because Iran, by intention, headed the policy on the ground of not nation to nation, but a religion again a religious. And from the very beginning, they stated that the state of Israel must be destroyed because we are a Jewish state, because the Jews also, not only. And it's not that only they declared on that, but the foreign policy of Iran stated on part, very integral part of the foreign convention foreign policy of Iran stated on the notion of terrorism. They used terrorism as a tool of foreign policy. For example, they blew up our embassy in Argentina, and then they blew up the uh, Jewish center in Buenos Aires as well. They uh, blew up the uh, US embassy as a marine in Beirut, and so on. And that in order to create a new hegemony in the Middle East, namely Iran will be the center, the leading group, it will recruit coalition first and foremost from its own Shiite people, basically Hezbollah in Lebanon, or the Shiite in southern uh, Iraq, 60% out of the Iraqis in the south are Shiite, most of them related to Iran, 20% central Iraq are Sunni Muslims, uh, Arabs, and 20% in the north are Kurds who are Muslim but non Arabs. And that in a one framework of a nation state. So they recruited, and of course the Houthis in Yemen, we'll refer to that later on, and they used them by proxies against us. Now they built an axis, I'm talking about the 80s, not now, an axis of Syria headed by Assad dynasty, okay? Is it Syrian Republic, but by Assad dynasty, first Hafez al-Assad, later on Bashar al-Assad, uh, who belongs to a small minority of 12% uh, of Alawite people who leading Syria for more than four decades and made an access with them and Hezbollah in Lebanon to keep us busy all the time with a missile, with a terrorist attack from Syria and Lebanon, while recruiting those who also agree with the policy of destroying the state of Israel, although they are Sunni factions like Hamas, to attack us from the south. At that point, they succeeded to keep us extremely busy from north and south and east, while they could re really develop their nuclear ability for the time to come. And that is a very smart strategy. The whole, so that was actually Iran, whose interest was and still is to keep this, to maintain this region not stable. For example, any attempt to come close to an agreement with the Palestinians, the Iranian jeopardize it because their interest is to keep this place in chaos, not, uh, not stable. And they created a new reality in the 80s. The other thing that's very significant at that point is that Islam or radical Islam started to be main component on the issue of the Middle East. Because I don't want to go back to the second half of the 19th century, the decline of the Ottoman Empire, building new identities in the Middle East, uh, uh, the decline of the Muslim Empire and building the nation state system basically in the years of World War I, yeah, headed by Sykes Picot Agreement in 1916, and shaping new identity for the rest of the people of the region. Instead of being Muslim or non Muslim who belonging to a Muslim empire, the last one in the chain was, of course, the Ottoman in the last 400 years out of 1,300. Now you can see yourself with another identity. Either you're Turk and you don't care about your former 
empire, or if you're not Turk and you're not Chechny, or you're not uh, Greek, or you're not Armenian, or you're not Kurd, you're probably something else. By the elimination, I would say Arab. So in the 20th of the 20th, 20th century, specifically in Beirut, the French college in Beirut, later on the American University of Beirut, they shaped the ideology of pan-Arabism. Pan-Arabism instead of pan-Islam, namely, now you consist your identity on national funds, not on religious funds. That means that if you are Christian or Druze or a Jew, you not necessarily have to be a Muslim in order to lead the new nationality. And that what happened in Syria, for example, one of the two founders of Ba'ath Party, Michel Affleck, and some George Antonius to the Palestinians and others, were Christian and not Muslim. That was not less than a revolution in the consciousness of the people uh, uh, of, the, of the place. That means the real new Middle East started then. That is a very formative of the Middle East. The end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and later on, we're talking about 100, 150 years, it's only a process of continuity and change, not Arab Spring, not revolution. It's simply a process that's going on and on. The main core issues in the Middle East are two, borders and identities. Nothing had changed from the end of the 19th century. It's changing by parameters, by places, by people, but the notion is still there. So, I don't want to go across the 20th century, but when we basically arrive to the late 40s, all the countries of the Middle East got their independence, including Israel, 46, 48. The last one who got independence was Sudan in 56, while the British and the French had to leave that area in the end of the 40s and leave the area alone for the natives, the Arabs, us, some others, to rebuild their own country, right? Now, take a look on the uh, leaderships of the Arab new countries. Right? There are three origins for that leadership. One, monarchy. Saudi Arabia, based, based on the Wahhabi tradition, that they're ruling on the two holy places in Mecca and Medina. Jordan, King uh, Abdallah, a descendant of uh, Hashem tribe, the, the tribe of the Prophet, and Morocco. Also, uh, the King of Morocco is part of the family of uh, Hashem tribe and so on. That's one, uh, one source. The other source is colonels and generals in those new countries that learn how to promote themselves by learning, universities, uh, commanding, and so on, got leadership. And they had a target to bring the newly countries to good situation, to better situation. Syria, Iraq, uh, uh, Sudan, and so, Yemen, and so on. Most of the time, after a few years, the revolution or Cap d'Etat failed totally, colossally. For example, in Syria itself, in one year, in 49, they got the independence in 46, there were three Cap d'Etat, Zaim, Hainawi, and Shishakli in one year. You cannot run a country stably when you have that kind of situation that people are not really ready to get to a to nation state uh, system. Now, it's not a matter that if we say, right, you, you have to go to elections, you are a democracy. It's a state of mind. It's an educational system. You cannot come in one day and expect that all the Arab countries will be democracies. We, we're talking about societies that grew up in clan system, Hamula system, they have tribal system. You cannot in one day expect that they will tolerate democracy, human rights, and so on and so forth. They used to old habits. You cannot take it out in one day. It's a long, long process. So sure enough, after a few years, that was a big failure in the Middle East. And most of the time, the colonial rule sometimes were better than the new regimes in the Middle East in Egypt, in Jordan, in Iraq, and so on. I don't want to go to the notion that the borders were artificial. Started in the 
20 years, all the story of sykes picot story and the new leadership of nations like in Syria, that the British promised to Sharif Hussein from Mecca when if, if he gonna help him in the World War I, he give his son's territory, Ali, Saudi Arabia, Abdullah, Transjordan, and Faisal, Syria. And when Faisal came to Syria in 1920, the new national Syrian kicked him out, and he got Iraq. And that's the way northern Iraq was founded. Or if you're checking, that's the truth in the Middle East. If you're checking the border between Egypt and the Sudan, and the Sudan is they drew the, uh, a line, a right line, and you, you wonder how come the border is so nice, it's no uh, straight, and so on. Of course, two... Uh, senior officials sat down and decided that will be the border. If they crossing tribes, family, cultures, uh, uh, religion, they don't care as long as it go well with the uh, colonial interest. But that we all know from Africa, from Middle East, from Asia, and so on. So actually, we grew up to instability structured in, in, in the Middle East. So when... Uh, for example, when Sudan got the independence, the last one, in 56, because the differences, the huge differences, the deep differences between the populations within a nation state called Sudan, in 55, a year before independence, they started a civil war be between the, the north and the south. Because the north considered Arab Muslim, and the south is black Christian or animist who has tendency to the Christian. So, and when you cross the sub-Saharan line from east to west, from Sudan all the way to Mauritania, you see the constant tension between those societies of blacks and Arabs because Arabs were the biggest slave traders in Africa. And this tension is going on there. Now, if you're coming to Sudan, you have a case that Arab Muslims that define their policy, their identity as part of the Middle East, fighting in the Africans in all kind of uh, lines that you like to see, blacks against Arabs, uh, Christians against Muslims, and so on, you have immediately a crisis. The crisis that took so many years that killed two million people in South Sudan during the years. And I'm not speaking about Western Sudan. The difference so it's too complicated. I don't want to go into it. Let's go uh, further and speak about Egypt. So if we said that, in fact, after, in the end of the 70s, practically there were no Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, we can see that if we're talking about today, uh, and you take a quick, quick look at the Middle East, you see that Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates, Jordan, believe it or not, in Israel, sharing the same interest based on two main interests. One, Iran. The problem of the Middle East that threatening mainly Saudi Arabia, but all the others as well. We were the most vocal, but Saudi Arabia is frightened to death because of Iran. I elaborate in a minute why. And Jordan, who cannot bear the, Saudi, the uh, Iranians, and all the rest, okay? And all of a sudden, we got a new president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah Sisi, that defines the national defense of Egypt differently. He said, our pan-Arabism uh, calling to destroy Israel, Israel is not relevant anymore. Why don't we use the opportunity that we have a long border with Libya, a failed state of 2,000 kilometers, open that ISIS can penetrate and make terrorist attacks in Egypt itself, in Sinai, and we have Sudan, which is an unreliable country. And just to remind you humbly that uh, Omar al-Bashir, the president of Sudan, is supposed to come to the ICC, to the International uh, uh, Court for a Criminal Court, because he convicted a crime against humanity, a genocide in Darfur between the years 2003 and 2005, right? So this guy, who is, who blowed together with Al Qaeda, the U.S. embassy in Kenya and Tanzania in '98 or '97, uh, uh, that guy cannot be trusted by Egypt. So Egypt said, "Look, uh, force him back," and he said, "Why don't we go for coalition with Israel?" 
and Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So all of a sudden, from enemies, we start and we uh, we started to cooperate with Egypt in a sense that we never knew before. I happened to be there in the right time, a very significant time, that the relationship with Egypt was really, really very intimate. You can talk about them, even about the military cooperation against ISIS and against Hamas in Sinai and Gaza. It's unbelievable. Me, who was a soldier 40 years ago, fighting against Arabs, cooperating with the Egyptian president on the sake for regional issues, mutual to, to all of us, and very successfully. That's a dream. The, I, I think the forefathers of Zionism, when they had their vision about how do we start, succeed to manage in that crazy neighborhood, they said, you know what, we'll go there, we'll develop the area step by step, then maybe our neighbors will get some benefit from that. Maybe if they don't like us, in, by the time they will recognize us, maybe, and so forth and so forth, as we say in Hebrew, and look what happened. It's exactly what happened now. Now, I'm stating that because the main problems, Iran and the terrorist groups, ISIS and so forth, are now in the other side when all the Arab Sunni countries, most of them, want to get rid of them. Besides Qatar, who is really the biggest state sponsor of terrorism in the world, that support Hamas, they support terrorism, financing terrorism everywhere, and Turkey, that, you know, in the 90s, its foreign minister then, Dabutulu, uh, said that Turkey's target called zero enemies. Show me one country is not enemy of Turkey today. Okay, uh, that is, I'm referring to the Tachlis, I'm referring to the reality, the fact that Turkey renew our full relationship with us a few months ago is wonderful. It's not because my beautiful eyes, of course. They have interest, and they would like to use our guests to be a hub of the guests to Europe. To speak about the record of Turkey about in human rights it needless to do, because you know that they threw most of the journalists to jail, the judges are out of the, 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 the army totally cleaned up by Erdogan. So I'm saying it in order to show you that li we're living in a very fragile area. Now, the luxuries of choosing our neighbors, it's definitely not Mexico or Canada. If only six, seven years ago, we spoke extremely seriously of having agreement with this butcher, Assad, very Assad, to give him back the Golan Heights in order to make peace with him. Why? Because the claim was that he will keep the stability in the area. Remember that? Only six, seven years ago. Right. Now, I'm trying, we are in, in a certain place that we need to be aware all the time about the changes. That was before the Arab Spring. That was uh, uh, a few times before then. And we need, we cannot choose our neighbors. We cannot uh, give, uh, we cannot look and say, okay, Sadat was not a Democrat. Of course he was not. But that's our neighbor. If we would like to make peace, we, ne we must make peace with those very neighbors. You know the story about Moses, I'm sure. Prophet Moses. You know that when he were take the Israelites out of Egypt and came to Mount Sinai, asked by God, where you want to take your people, the Israelites, Moses was very smart. And he wanted to tell him that he wanted to take us to Canada. A lot of, <laughs> you know, a lot of water, very, very nice weather. But he was a stutter. So it came out like, kick, 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 none. And ever since we stuck there, we didn't choose our neighbors. That's what we have now. And another thinking, what are people choosing a stutterer, a stutterer to be their leader? That's a different story. Anyway, uh, uh, so those are the people we cannot preach them about democracy and human rights. That's what we have. We need to respect it. We don't have to dictate anybody. We're not dealing with them. You forgive me, with Tikkun Olam. No. We're dealing with the issues, with the reality. And if uh, the Jordanian king is not Democrat, and he is not, 
We have to, de to live with the reality. What can we say? Now, there's a tremendous opportunity now because crisis is always opportunity. It's not only a risk. I try to portray to you to the new reality, the new framework in the Middle East. Most of the Sunni Arab countries are coming in one coalition of interest with us. The only cause that makes troubles to us, believe it or not, was the U.S. U.S., instead of coming with that coalition to head it, I'm speaking from Middle Eastern perspective, it went with, believe it or not, Iran and Qatar. With all kinds of... That portrayed in the Middle East in a very, very, very bad uh, uh, perspective because when the administration kicked out Mubarak, who was corrupted and everything, and on, didn't deal with human rights, but still, an ally of the U.S. for 30 years, he kicked him out, and the thinking here, I assume, was, okay, we're cleaning now, we're contributing to a new, better Middle East. It's perceived by the Arab countries, the Arab neighbor, as betrayal of the Arabs for in the Saudis, in the Egyptians, in the Jordanians, in the Emirates, because we're looking at things from here. But they looking from things very differently from there. Okay, I'm simply point out about the differences and how uh, 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 all the sanctions that uh, having been uh, on on President Sisi because his problem with uh, violation of human rights, as well as we were in South Sudan and South Sudanese claim which. U.S. helps them a lot. I don't know how many billions they contributed in three years, 37 or so on. I'm, I'm talking about the Sudanese fabric, not only to South Sudan. And then South Sudan had claim against the U.S. Who has a claim to somebody who gives you? As they said, how can they come and hug Bashir and say he will bring stability to the Middle East when he support, he's a criminal, he support against humanity, and they blaming us the South Sudanese, a new, newly born country, in violating the human right. In other words, when we working in another area, we must take into, uh, into consideration how we perceive on the other's point of view. Sometimes we have a great intentions, but when it's come into being, that perceived very, very differently. So we are. It's even much more complicated. I don't know how long should I go, but uh, I, I, I give you two small examples. One, Syria. Syria <clears throat> that immediately Putin saw the situation, penetrated to Syria to, to, uh, to prove that if the US perceived in the Middle East as a non-trustable ally, Russia is a trustable area, and if needed, to kill people, not only ISIS, but everywhere, Syrian citizens, they will do it in order to show to Assad, we are behind you, you can trust us, all right? Iran is there, Saudi Arabia is there, Turkey is there, ISIS is there, and only other 40, uh, 54 opposition organizations functioning within Syria, okay? And I just remind you humbly, that we are remote from Syria. Syria are remote, there's here outside, you can see a picture. Syria, uh, Damascus remote from the Golan Heights only 40 miles, that's all. All the war is going on there. It's on our door, step door, really there. Uh, and ISIS, uh, a month ago, tried to uh, shoot missiles on, 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 on our troops uh, for the first time. Second time was from Sinai, when uh, uh, Egypt didn't succeed to prevent what they usually do, uh, to, uh, shoot, to launch those missiles on the Lat and the Negev area. Okay? So that is a new neighborhood. We need to know how to live with it. Now, this, the fact that the relationship be, among the actors are not perfect is well known. Is well known. The interest of Egypt and Saudi Arabia can come together in the issue of Iran. But when it comes to Syria, there are differences. Egypt changed the policy supporting Russia because they think that Assad 
stabilizing uh, uh, Syria for a moment, till we'll find a solution. It's better than to have an open borders and chaos in Libya on their own border. So they go with Russia. So the Saudis are angry because they said, and they suspended the uh, few billions that they're giving, billions uh, that they're giving to Egypt for oil and infrastructure in Sinai and Egypt itself. Yemen, we have a war in Yemen, same system that we have in Israel. Instead of using the Hezbollah against us, they're using the Houthis against the Saudis, against the Yemenites, provoking a war against the Saudis. And the Saudis, how do I, uh, uh, how do I define it, are not doing greatly in Yemen, okay? They're losing, they, 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 they're losing every day many millions in uh, dollars in, in Yemen, but they have the coalition. Egypt with them, uh, in a way, they have, even Sudan joined the coalition uh, of the Arab Sunni countries, again, uh, again uh, Iran, and by the instructions of Saudi Arabia and the attempt of Bashir of Sudan to show nice face to the West in order to get out from the list of uh, states that support terrorism, he started to say, you see, I cut the relationship with Sudan, and they started to talk about uh, uh, establishing relationship of state of Israel. Uh, it's not real, but they're saying in order to, to show, even last week, uh, uh, a uh, radical Islamic scholar from Sudan stated that he would like to have a relationship. It's not according, not against the Sharia, He's ready to do so, and it's fine. And if somebody uh, not happy with that within Sudan, they can go to hell. He thinks that he stands firm about uh, this idea. Think for a moment what we're talking about. In Sudan, Khartoum, June 67, six-day war. August 67, the famous summit, Arab summit in Khartoum with the three nodes. No recognition, no negotiation, no peace with Israel. Now Sudan is requesting, whether it's truly or not, to establish relationship with Israel. That's a different situation, a different situation. The opportunity now is to lead that coalition normally, go against Iran and go against the uh, terrorist groups, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood, and so on, and try to find finally a new situation in the Middle East. Now, the other organization, Hezbollah, I spoke with uh, somebody here before the, the meeting, uh, are proxies of Iran. And the part of the problem that I mentioned before, it's a big, deep split be between the, the Sunni faction of Islam, which is the majority, and the minority of the Shiite within Islam. And that split, which I call Sunni-Shiite split, or if you like, the Sushi split, right? It's so deep that if you look in their websites, in both sides, they say about each other that they are worse than the Jews. To my mind, they're both right. But anyway, that's supposed to be the biggest insult to say about each other. So the war is serious. And if somebody saw that Huntington was wrong, and I know that in this university people think that he was wrong, he was not. I'm sorry to say that. And the clash is not only between civilization. The clash is within Islam itself. The fight on the soul of Muslim now is between the crazy minority who believes in jihad to kill all the time, and most of the Muslims who are normal people, like you and me, hopefully I'm normal, I'm not sure, that believe in normal life. And the fight, especially in the West, is on the souls of the young Muslims to whether we can radicalize them or not. Because when they're going in London or in Brussels or in Holland or Germany, they're telling the young people, young students, you are new, young generation. Your uh, grandmother and grandfather came to Europe to work as blue collar, and now you have citizenship. And what happened? You graduate of the best universities in Europe, 
and you are exterminated again. You have to go against those countries who are hosting you, against France, against Britain, against Holland, and go and fight for the true Islam, the radical Islam, with that. That's the reason why they're going to join ISIS, all these young guys from Europe. And this double talk of those radical Muslims, including in America, Bro, include, here there's a scholar, a Muslim scholar called Yusuf al Alwani. He wrote a book called, in Arabic, uh, is there an Arabic speaker here? Uh, we call it Fiqh al Aqaliyat al Muslima, means that the uh, Sharia for Muslim minorities. In other words, how to live in a country's democ democracies in the West as a minority in a sense that you uh, preserving your jihadist intentions, but you're pretending that you're part of the society. Another talk with two languages. That's a minority in Islam. It doesn't say that all the Muslims are like that. In the contrary. But they're reflecting on other Muslims. They're uh, challenging the other Muslims. And if we, as hosting of those people, going with the radicals instead of the normal people, we're making a big mistake for now, for the time being. And we're making a big mistake here, specifically in California, uh, because we don't differentiate because of the PC, because of the post-truth, because of definition of reality, and so on. We need to be clear and clean and, and straight and understand what we're facing. And that goes back to the Middle East immediately. So. Um, I can go on and on, but I think I can leave you a room for Q&A. Thank you very much.